Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Shira Gans and I'm at the New York City Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment. Thank you so much for joining us today for our masterclass studio sessions. These masterclasses are a partnership between our office and the New York chapter of the Recording Academy. It's part of our June is New York Music Month initiative, which happens every year during June. Today is actually our last event of June, but you can check out all the events we've had that have been recording and are up on our website. I'll put it in the chat. I'm really excited for today's masterclass. It's a star-studded panel of Grammy Award winners. And so without further ado, I'm gonna hand you off to Ann Minselli and she's gonna take you on a deep dive of immersive audio. Thanks everybody. Hey everyone. Thanks to the Recording Academy and P&E Wing in New York for having me. Thanks to the mayor's office and Shira Gans for really you know, doing these masterclasses. They're really important for our music industry to keep developing it and pushing the technology forward. My name is Ann Mincelli. I'm a um, studio owner in New York, Jungle City Studios. I'm Alicia Keys, engineer and album project manager for the past 22 years. And, um, you know, I wanted to introduce you to the team who we built. Uh, Alicia took a deep dive and into immersive audio, and I was tasked with putting an incredible team together. And most of these guys that are on the team, Michael Romanowski, Eric Schilling, and George Massenberg, we worked together for years with the Recording Academy, helping develop many different initiatives across the board, you know, the broad spectrum of the academy so it was only right to bring them in as we were going to remix eight albums in immersive audio and we've been working together on this technology developing it the last i'd say five years because the producers and engineers wing always had a committee dedicated to this so it was only right and without further ado let me introduce you to michael romanowski Eric Schilling and George Massenberg. I would love for them to give a description and their backgrounds. Let's start with Eric. Uh, good morning, or I guess there it's around noon. Um, my background is I started in studios when I was 19. Went through being a tape op, old technology, tape machines, consoles, but I always had a love for new things and new technology. And all of us here in this group have seen a lot of things change. And it's been about five years to, five years since I jumped into spatial. And uh, it's been a great pro it's been great to learn about it and to explore. And with this group, we help we help trade concepts and ideas and solve problems and learn things. So thank you. Michael? I'm glad I didn't have to go first because I wasn't sure how much to get into <laughs> the going first part. Well, I uh, thanks, Ann. Thanks for having us uh, be a part of this, and thanks to the mayor's office. Um, I got actually I got started way back in uh, uh, live sound when I was in college playing in a band, and I realized there was somebody in the back of the room twisting knobs for people in the front of the room, and I didn't understand that. And I wanted to know. Just my inquisitive nature said, "What What are these people doing affecting us?" And so. I just kept asking questions until after a long time, I, or a while, I ended up becoming the house sound person after a series of, you know, of uh, filling in and events and stuff. And that just led me on of the path of the, uh, of looking at engineering and how it's putting, how it's expressing the artistic uh, connection. Uh, I went to, I went to school for math and computer science and uh, started working on people's records as a producer and as an engineer. And uh I would say through a through a series of events, uh, actually a long motorcycle trip 30 years ago uh, from Nashville put me in a, a job opportunity as a mastering engineer. And as soon as I found out, you know, exactly what it was and all that off and running, loved it. It's exactly the, the apex of all of my interests. Um, I built my first. So I did that I've almost 30 years. I, I uh, um, uh, built my first room, uh, surround room. Paul Stolbein and I had a, had partnered on a, on a place, and we had uh, two five one rooms that we built in two thousand one, two thousand two. So been in it for a while. Um, 
love the idea of taking it to another dimension and incorporating that. So I started experimenting and trying things um, uh, five years ago or so and adding height speakers and working with companies and and uh, helping, you know, that's something that I think that we all really, we all share is we've all spent a lot of time working with the companies and and people developing the technology and the tools. And our experimentation has gotten us to a spot where, you know, we're advising them and, and building and it's informing us and we're informing them. And so I'm just happy to be on that journey and part of this team. And thank you for pulling us all together because, you know, I think we've also all really grown through the shared experience figured a lot of things out and taken it to a new level. And I'm, I'm super proud of the work that we've all done. And, and it's be only just the beginning. Together. Exactly. Go ahead, George. We'll save the best for last. Go ahead. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll try my best. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Guys, thank you very much for having me. Uh, thanks for uh, getting this together. And you're, you're, you're brilliant. I'm George Massenberg. I'm an early adopter and basically an instigator. I'm a troublemaker. Uh, currently, I'm a professor of sound recording at McGill University. I'll not bore you with the history, but I started in the studio in somewhere around 1963, 1964. But there's never been a better time than now to be making music and making great recordings. I'll just leave it at that. Thanks, guys. It's great to be with you. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, George. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Michael. What I would like to do now is share my screen. I have a really cool presentation that the, I work at Sony and the folks at Sony, Donna Klopfer, we put together this really important deck as we develop the twists and turns of this technology. And I believe the deck is really incredible because it bridges the gap between professional and consumer. So I'm going to go through it really quickly and I'm going to share my screen and then um, We'll have some questions after that. All right, can everyone see that? Yeah? Yep. Okay, great. So what is spatial audio and immersive audio? Here we go, here's how we evolve. We started with the typical stereo file, stereo mix, which is still very popular today across multiple platforms. Then we went into surround and then we went into 3D surround, which is, you know, Dolby Atmos, and we went into 360 degree audio, which is 360 RA. So I want to explain a little bit about the differences in that technology. Immersive spatial audio expands on traditional stereo and surround sound. It increases the number of speakers and the sound field around the user. Dolby Atmos is mixed with a dome concept. It works in line with DAWs such as Pro Tools Logic and Nuendo and can be mixed using speakers or headphones. 360 audio is mixed with a sphere concept, 360 degree image. It works in line with DAWs such as, sorry, my screen is, uh, Pro Tools Ableton, Nuendo and Logic. This format can be mixed using speakers or headphones. Immersive and spatial audio are terms used to describe and enhance surround experience. Immersive audio gives you the ability to hear music from all directions. Immersive is the term used by the professional audio community. Spatial is used in marketing and branding. Dolby Atmos and 360 Audio RA are the platforms for creating spatial content. One key shift in the audio production and playback technology is a transition from channel-based audio to mixing to object-based audio. In channel-based audio, mixing is like mono, stereo, and traditional sound. A mix engineer would mix to a specific speaker setup and print a final mix with files designed to be output to those channels. Channel-based output limit limits the playback ability to one type of system. In this case, a 5.1 system. Now, object-based audio is mixing in, a, in an adaptive way. Instead of mixing to a channel output, an engineer mixes with a virtual sound field. Placing objects within the sound field allows for outputting a single deliverable, which can be used to extrapolate for po potentially any output device. I'm gonna switch to the next page. 
So how do we create immersive mixes? Existing stems and expanded stems are located or created from original multi-tracks. Some artists include premix files. These files are helpful tools in creating and reimagining mixes. Some artists make completely new mixes. The stems and files are processed and edited to match the final approved version of a song. The stems are then placed and programmed in the immersive environment using software platforms such as Dolby Atmos and 360 Walk Mixer Creator. So you have your references created. I'm about to switch. Um, so these are the screenshots of the object-based mixing interfaces for both 360 and Dolby RA. You could see the differences between both platforms. One could see the spherical sound field in the 360 interface and the dome shape in the Atmos interfaces. The output from these mixes is a package which contains the object audio information. These can, these can be encoded and decoded differently depending on your listening device, whether that be a theater, a sound system, a smart speaker, or stereo headphones. Object-based mixing and encoding technology will continue to improve over time. What are the challenges? Which I'll ask some of these questions to George and the crew later. Technology and creation tools are new and still in development. Replicating the speaker playback to the consumer in headphones. Comparison to a stereo mix is a big key. You know, a lot of artists, they, they live with their stereo mixes for a very long time. And then it's time consuming and expansive to create a mix and get, her, get approval. And the biggest thing, which we're gonna talk to George later because he's working on the deliverables and improving the deliverables and assets is locating the proper assets. And then spatial audio and streaming services. How can you listen to spatial audio? Here is how. Spatial audio is now a marketing and editorial driver for Amazon, Tidal, Apple Music, and others. With the increased focus from DSPs on the emerging customer experience, immersive audio mixing gives artists and labels marketing an opportunity to partner with DSPs on a higher level. It engages users at a new innovative point of interest and creates moment around catalog by offering fans a new way to discover and experience your music. So how do we listen to spatial audio? Anyone that's on the Apple Music platform, Amazon Music platform, Deezer and Tidal. I'll share this deck and this page. So on Apple Music, you can listen on your headphones, specifically AirPods Pro and AirPods Pro Max. You can listen through Apple TV and you can listen through supporting Apple devices like your MacBook Pro, iPad, and iPhone. Whoops, it went one page too far. Sorry about that. Listening on headphones via Amazon Music is uh, through the mobile app, Android device, plus the iOS platform or you can use their Echo Studio Pro and supported devices via AirPlay and Google Cast. On Deezer, you can listen through headphones. There's more, it's more of a customizable experience with Sony headphones, uh, supported devices via AirPlay and Google Cast. And on Tidal, we have uh, headphones is the way you can uh, listen to 360 audio mixes. It's a more customized experience for 360 audio with Sony headphones. Supported devices are AirPlay and Google Cast. And lastly is just some of the, you know, ways consumers can, you know, purchase devices, which is the Amazon Echo Studio and the new Sony SRS RA 5000. Um, and that's it regarding my deck. Um, I'll unshare the screen now so we could see some questions. I'm also going to be asking my fellow panelists some questions. So let me shut my screen share off real quick. All right, George, I have a question for you. How do we evolve the technology? What are the pitfalls um, and how do we evolve it? You know, what what do we need to what do we need to do to evolve it? 
two sides. Um, the preparation of the uh, mixes is one side, the delivery of finished mixes is the other. Starting with delivery of finished mixes, would be terrific if these systems were more compatible with each other. Uh, although Apple and Atmos are kind of uh, joined at the hip, uh, it's not clear that um, any of the others, uh, Sony and um, they're, they're not able to share files. So a uh, file streaming on Apple or a file intended to stream on Apple won't exactly fit into the Sony world. Right. Now, we're making different mixes right now. But right. clearly, the future is better standardization uh, between the two manufacturers, and in particular behind Fraunhofer, Fraunhofer's work in developing uh, some of the uh, tools, the software tools. We're more ad ad adept at uh, cross-interpreting, uh, sharing, translating what's called metadata. Metadata is use, it's useful in thinking that it's a way of describing where the sound is coming from in numbers, in a right. polar coordinate space. Um, a speaker coming from a certain place in Sony might ask to find that speaker in Atmos and Atmos would need a virtual location to place that speaker in. Am I getting right. too technical yet or are we okay? No, we're okay. On the, let me skip back to the preparation side. Um, for us to make two separate mixes or three separate mixes or four separate mixes is pretty complicated, especially as Eric is, is showing me step by step, because he's done more of this than I have, um, this cross correlation between an Atmos delivery and a Sony delivery to the record label whoever that is, um, and interpreting those are uh, easy for us to do in a way. Uh, Eric will describe how he, at some point, when you take his master class, how he takes uh, low frequency elements and routes them to the Sony front lower ring because Sony doesn't have an LFE little things like that. Sony has a God speaker. Got to put something there. Sony is, is it three and one, uh, Eric? Three and two. Three and two, no side speakers. That's yeah. right. Five yeah. on two layers. Uh, and okay. Right. And we have to figure out how to get uh, Atmos set, call 7.0.2 into 5.5 dot something. It would be great to have immediate work tools. Sorry to interrupt, Eric. Go ahead, Eric. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to add to what you're saying, George. I think what we've done on Alicia's stuff, and this is we learned a lot in the last year in this pro, in, in this workflow, is part, part part of it for me is once I learned the two tools, I could think about what am I doing in an Atmos mix that I can use and prep myself for the Sony mix. So that was George, like you said. One has a sub, one does not. So what do I do with that? That's just a case in point. So right. it's a little- We want the mixes to translate, right? The mixes uh, want to translate. Exactly. Right. And, and I, so for the consumer, that's the goal. Yeah. How do I make my mix translate, right? So- uh, And to the artist. The artist needs to hear his or her mix back. Yeah. Like it's the record. Right. They, want to hear, they want to hear it back the way they conceived it and they want the consumers yeah. to hear it the same way and they don't care about the you know the, the the tools the playback whatever they want to put it on and just listen and know that they're they're hearing the artist's intent so and eric I and i are in the middle of a, a project and what we're talking about is uh for us making several different kinds of mixes making uh our kind of bed mix making a separated um oh, excuse me separate objects should we stop and talk about objects? No. Uh, making separate ob objects so that Michael might be able to resolve these. Michael might be able to combine objects into targeting different 
uh, technologies. Maybe we haven't, we're still doing that ourselves, but maybe that's the future of this is throwing all of our problems in Michael's lap. <laughs> I'm a problem solver, George. I, I do my best to, to figure out, learn things and make them as best they can. And, and so, I think that um, one thing as well is the labels have to evolve. They have to treat this as a regular album project. Sometimes the budgets have to be there. The protocols have to be there you know, hiring a mastering engineer and all the different ways that we work on an album, we have to have the same type of approach when we're mixing immersive audio. That's More right. artists will jump on board as opposed to the labels trying to say, the stereo mix and the immersive mix need to be the same. And my second question to this is, Michael and George and Eric, you know, technology still has to evolve, right? Michael, the gain stage is completely different. Right. And we know the artists are listening to their stereo mixes in their cars loud. And then all of a sudden the gain stage for immersive is not the same from stereo file to a, you know, object-based file, correct? That's so we got, a, we got a question to explain an object. What an object is in yep. the immersive space is very simply one source in space. You may call it a speaker, you may call it a position in between speakers, but an object has a physical space and in a physical location. In a well, in a a, an X, Y, Z coordinate. It has a, has yeah, a, I'll put the right. uh, page back up too. To and that's, you. and that's, an, that's one there we object. Go. There's the objects. Right? And here's many objects. And yeah. maybe you're, uh, those of us who are used to making bed tracks for motion picture, your 7.1 is possibly a group of eight objects with special positions. And the strength of that, just to jump ahead, is that in the playback space, be it home theater, be it any one of uh, a number of earbud or earphone systems, and in the theatrical presentation space, these objects can be re-rendered to find the right spot in this spherical space. That's not yes, too complicated. Is, is it? Here is the um, display and what George is explaining. And this is the differences, 360 audio objects versus Dolby. And I explained already the differences with the dome shape and the 360 audio, how they do there is different. I can give you some of these. I'll talk to the mayor's office and see if I can share a couple of these documents with you. Great. I just stopped sharing. And then Michael, technically, yeah. Um, what, how do we keep growing this technology from a mastering standpoint? Like we've already developed crossfades, right? At one point we didn't have the ability to do crossfades when we're matching catalog and, 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 you know, mastering compressors and plugins being multi-channel and, and time aligning files to really dig in and do a mix. And yeah. then I want to ask Eric, um, you know, go ahead, Michael. Oh, 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 oh um. Well, you can ask Eric if you want, uh, jump into that and we can proceed or, well, anyway, so yeah, but you, well, actually you asked, go ahead. Well, you asked something about, you started earlier, uh, like before we, we got into the objects thing, started heading down the path of the difference of the listening perspective from the artists or the, you know, versus headphones or stereo stuff. And that, you know, that that's one of the things that we, you know, we're wrestling with right now is that people are so used to hearing um, if you're working on headphones, the center image in the middle of your head, right? You've got two right. bullhorns just screaming like this, and you've got this thing. The opportunity of spatial audio, immersive, is able to put a listener in a space that's not in the center of their head. So it's a, it's a, a, a to some people, it's jarring right away thinking, well, I'm used to hearing this. And I think sometimes just having the discussion to just, you know, settle back, just listen, just absorb, be very Zen about the listening and the expectation not being trying to recreate the stereo in the same way. Like even if you're um, and th this goes back to, to tools and procedures and best practices as well is having two channels to get audio to come out of presents a certain picture. But when you bring things around you and above you, and in Sony's case, below you, you have a different picture to present. And, and it's just, it's, there's an education process about letting the listener, the artist, the label and the consumer all, you know, know what that perspective is. You, you asked about tools. And, you know, I think that's one of the things we got to be tricky about. We, we, 
you know, we 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 uh, developed processes along the way with these uh, these eight albums. Uh, whether it was in the mix process or the mastering process, I learned a lot and pushed a lot. We, you know, we talked. You talked about crossfades. You know, for the for the uh, you know um, uh, other than in the surround era, we thought of albums in the immersive. So far, we've most a lot of people have been approaching as singles and tracks, and not really about album album right. metadata album loudness level throughout, right, throughout you know uh timing and space between you know all of those and how did the transitions from one space to another so the tools are we're, we're still all of us are all in conversation develop helping to develop those tools to the things that we had to figure out along the way like you said crossfades how do we deal with that does it have to be in a mixed position do we have to alternate ending do we have to how do we do something that doesn't have pq markers you know if we're not and, we're and not dealing with a so, standard right? CD type playback. We had to make one album in a block. We put all the yeah. sessions. So my myself and my assistant, Brendan, we had to spend. So the way we mix this template, we put stems and we put raw files, premix files to give George, yeah. Eric and Michael the ability to use the raw files and not just be limited to using stems from our mixer. You know, we had to import those all together, but Alicia had interludes between each song and it was her she didn't want to put you know the labels push this technology out without thinking about a lot of these issues it's like we had to put the album in as a whole block 14 songs with the crossfades in between because there's no way to mark the ids properly in the in these softwares and what i wanted to ask eric i kind of had you on deck is how we approach the catalog mixing and how we approached the new albums that we did. I think catalog is critical because consumers are used to hearing these mixes. They know these mixes for years and years and years. There's no way that the DSPs can just shut the stereo file off and say, well, here's the immersive audio file, bling, 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 here it is. So when we worked with Alicia, you know, Eric, we came to your studio many times to really dive in and that was critical for the artists to be involved and to approve the mixes and to really bring the people that worked on the albums originally into the fold. And that goes back to what George is saying. That's what goes back to what George is saying about budgeting, what George is saying about like, those are some of the pitfalls. It's not just the business of pump and do these 50 albums that are in our catalog. It's how do we make it all work together? Stereo, Dolby 360 catalog, new material this is the artist's art and we have to respect that and the technology companies and the labels need to understand that so go ahead eric i would love to hear so, your your feedback on that so it's curious so, so a good point was for the old, older stuff the catalog stuff our approach was we have a stereo and that's the guidepost and it's the guidepost in the sense of how the song feels and how it's how we blended it or how you blend, blended it when you created the stereos. So when I started to make it into 3D immersive, I would use the stereo to go back, back and forth as my guidepost, but it doesn't have to sound exactly the same. It needs to just feel like the stereo. And I remember when you guys first came and Alicia and you sat up at the front mix position. And when Alicia started to hear stuff from various spots, I could see her visceral reaction i remember she kind of moved her hands like i've never heard it like this before but yet by the same token there were things that you guys would point out to me that need to feel like the stereo so whenever i start a immersive thing one of the things i need to find out is it, is it need to feel like the story or are we going to do a bit of a remix and move away from that so on the new one and for instance, we probably have a little more room to do that. So that's, and I'm going to give a case experience something, here. something I'm doing right now. I'm starting on a game soundtrack, and they just came to the studio this week. And to your point, uh, Michael, they've never heard something in in a in a spatial room. Mm. So it took them a moment to get used to it trombones are coming from here, strings are from over here, choirs from there. So when we mix this stuff, a lot of what we do up front is talk about sound design. How do we want to design this spatial environment? So, Anne, 
with you. You and me had those conversations with the game people and having those conversations. That's that's part of the role. And then one last thing I want to add is when I mix, I mix on speakers. We check it on headphones. We have the two devices here that you showed on the slide, and we have a sound bar. So I will take the clients sometimes. And if you remember, Ian, we took the sound bar up to Alicia's studio a year ago, and she heard the final honest sound bar. And that's really important, right? That's how yeah. it's going to translate to the consumer, right? Exactly. And exactly. listening on the Amazon device, does we understand, as George is explaining, this all ties together, you know? Um, and then George, we started this almost 2019 at Blackbird yep. Yep. when the software wasn't as developed. We had about 20 sessions for Alicia's song called Show Me Love. It was her lead off single. So it was important for her to do something special with the, you know, the Dolby mix. Remember when we did this big event at Dolby, we started at Blackbird. We wound up in New York. We were in LA with Michael, like, this was big. We probably had 30 sessions alone to start off this whole three year process, right? Well, and it started with your giving us the direction of we'd like to take advantage of this new technology. So, to a certain degree, we'll be reimagining the mix. Correct. And we may have taken some things too far, some things maybe we needed to explore deeper, but we learned more about what not to do than I ever would have expected. Um, and one of the things that really helped was listening to our product on different technologies, listening to it on e earphones, on earbuds, listening to it re-rendered into five and, and trying to figure out what doesn't work. And I don't wanna go too far into this, but there are certain uh, companies that bring up the high end in the rear and rear height speakers. And you put a tambourine or hand claps back there, and you'll be very surprised what you get back. You're kind you of need to, right. yeah. Well, that translatability is is huge because again, that's back to having the artist know that their music is being played and listened to as right. closely as possible. So it's our job to make sure that it does translate, and it particularly right. falls on you know me as a mastering engineer to to especially with with working with you guys. Two different mixers on the same project goes back to the thought of an album versus singles that are people put and how do you make it seem like a body of work not a collection right. of songs and i did want to say one thing you were we were talking about tools real quick and i was <clears throat> the, the thought of compression i just wanted to follow up on that yeah. for a second in the tools you know in the stereo world <clears throat> excuse me in the stereo world you only have two speakers and we're trying to get a lot of information into those two speakers the techniques involved in getting uh, 60 instruments or 100 vocals or you know whatever to one acoustic guitar whatever it is out of stereo is out of two speakers we have developed over the last you know 50 60 70 80 years techniques of of um, um, processing eq compression gain reverb right. delay all of those things to create this sense of space out of two when we're talking about all of these speakers, we don't, and, and all of this space, we have an opportunity to be as dynamic and as engaging. I look at compressors as tone devices, not necessarily, and not looking at them as loudness things. And I think when people think about compression, especially in the immersive world and thinking about how to try to recreate that stereo, they're taking things and, and, comp and compressing. But what's happening is things that are out in this in this world around you close in the more you compress it the more you're coming into coming into that you know point source to begin with so i i would you know recommend to folks is maybe as you're exploring this don't try to go down that path of putting 10 pounds of something in a five pound hole but but think about how the space works around and let it be the thing that pulls the artist or pulls the listener into the music, not the bullhorn that's shouting at them. That's one of the huge opportunities I see with immersive audio. Right. I'm going to, I'm going to, I have one more question about live music and I was going to throw it at Eric. Um, and then we'll go to some questions. I see Jeff Silverman has a really good question. I would love George and Michael to answer. Eric, where do we sit with, we do broadcast together a lot. We do live shows together a lot. You know, Eric travels the world with us sometimes on our team. Where do you see this going in the live space, in the broadcast space? Well, there's two things happening. One for just live events for installed shows. You're starting to do 
a immersive sound in live events in Vegas, for instance, there's a bunch of, there's a bunch of installed shows are doing it. In broadcast, it's starting to occur around the world, not so much here in the US yet. And actually the people who are doing it the most right now are sports. A lot yeah, of sporting I'm events. To see, quite a while I'm excited done. to see how it evolves. We're and gonna- They've been doing that for a long time. Soccer yeah. and surround has been around for We're a long time. We're gonna dive into our Unplugged album. That's gonna be our next thing we mix. Right. It's, a live, it's a live show um that we're going to put it out on vinyl because it was never on vinyl and the flip side of it is we're going to tackle it and put it out in immersive audio and then i know dolby is working on a lot of incredible things in the live space and streaming mm -hmm. so i think the door is really open to mm -hmm. really start exploring a lot of that stuff let's let's take some questions here jeff silverman as you know apple music doesn't read dolby atmos metadata and to me is not as an accurate representation of my binaural render mixes. Any thought if there is going to be any advancements with Apple and Dolby to actually give the listener a choice between spatial audio and 3D binaural? This is probably the greatest question I think that we all single-handedly yeah. have. <laughs> <laughs> and anybody that's worked with Apple knows that Apple is a very insular company. Yeah. Uh, very little data gets into their ecosphere. Very little non-marketing data gets out of their ecosphere. Occasionally, you'll see a technical paper, mm. but not on this. So we have some friends who have gone to Apple. We're hoping that we can we can drill deeper into Apple and see what our choices might be and just hope for the best. In terms of interpreting metadata, I'd, I'd like to see Fraunhofer contribute there uh, because they know both, both areas and they can, but it's a matter of remapping an object and remapping its metadata. And it's, it's possible, it's just computer code. A 14 year old in Finland could write it. Uh, I mean, George, I know that Fraunhofer is starting to go down that road. It's a question of People make Atmos and Sony, they have to figure out how to speak a common um, language in terms of their files. So it's it's on the road. And I think it's something that we as a group and all people involved in this need to push more so that these platforms can talk. So we cannot have to do something three times or two times. Yeah, and I think that's the definitely something that's going to be happening in the future for sure. It's, is that as we're happen. evolving, it's got yeah. to. It's like it's like yeah. you know DVD A and SACD and you know blue. Or like originally there was one player for each format, and they finally realized yeah. the best thing you know is like looking at the. Somebody's you know, going to come up with an app too that's going to be able to like. Yeah. You know. I, I think it's that, not out of the question, Anne, because yeah, it's yeah. just numbers. It's yeah. it's no black. It's this is That's not what you're black saying. Magic. Exactly. Yeah. Just numbers. Exactly. And it has that, to happen. I think what happened is the marketing from Dolby and Sony and the partnerships with the DSPs has pushed the technology quick. But we have to remember there's the backside of developing all the all the tech and evolving and getting artists involved, not dictating to the artists. This is how we're doing stuff but have Absolutely. them involved in the process. Again, it's the artist's art. This stuff right. has to translate. You can't be on Apple Music, you know, and a pop-up shows up that like your stereo files being deleted. There's a lot of things we have to grow on, right? Like, like you can't dictate. Apple really kind of wants to dictate to us how it should be. And it's not how it should be in their viewpoint is not proper. Well, right. it's all about marketing. Uh, these companies, right. Apple in particular, it's all about marketing. And I don't know whether marketing is really sensitive to this new technology yet or, or how they're getting their feedback, how marketing is getting feedback and through marketing, and because Apple does a lot of research, through marketing down to R&D. How does that flow? How is what we need interpreted to engineering? Very hard to find out. You know, uh, uh, back to uh, back to Jeff's question though, real quick. I I did want to, uh, you know, the I do know through conversation. So one of the issues, and I can j just to answer technically, if it's not you know whatever too much, and uh, conversation wise, is that they um, because of how Apple spatializes, they take the ADM file and are spatializing a seven one four with a binaural render of that. That at the moment, 
that eliminates your choices of binaural render mode settings. That's, That's that gets right. stripped out in that. And there, there are conversations going in right now, I know, on how to try to create, keep that in, in place and still respect whatever their spatialization process is that they're doing. A, a workaround, something I worked on, uh, a project, I, I worked on the Dune soundtrack, the Atmos version of the Dune soundtrack, which was uh, 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 fantastic. What they decided to, uh, the stereo version as well, but what they decided for the stereo version is knowing that most people, <clears throat> excuse me again, knowing that many people, 80% plus, would be listening on headphones probably to a soundtrack like this they're in what, what they're calling the intentional stereo their intentional stereo mix was the binaural render they just said oh, wow. screw people who are listening on 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 stereo speakers we expect you're going to be listening on a sound bar or headphones and if so it's going to decode and this is what it's going to be that's an extreme choice but an option jeff yeah. well that's a real turning point yeah so sarah galvin asked how does an immersive mix translate to a single point monitor eric um poorly or anyone? Uh, <laughs> not exactly a softball eric <laughs> <laughs> i mean i think in the devices that you showed uh the devices you showed on your slides let's say one of the two i won't name the one is kind of a single point speaker it does it's not bad, but I would say if you're going to go into a speaker system, you probably your better bet is a soundbar. You know, I would say those devices are the lowest common denominator, so it gives you a spatial effect, but it's not as specific as a soundbar. Well, and they can take any technology and most of them can. Yeah. yeah, most of them you can feed from some other device, whether it's an Apple TV or NVIDIA Shield, or you can play all the different formats through through most of them also. And and when you get to this quiet question, there's one from Gary that I want to speak to. Go ahead. When Read it off. I'm looking at a different text. Yeah, so it's funny because it's, it has to do with what we're doing now for um, LP8. It says, if you're going to mix two feeds, say, a piano and a voice for Alicia, the um, the um, what I'm doing is some of it's piano and voice, maybe one other thing. And my first thought was, what do I do with this in spatial? I'm still creating a space around it, so I'm using I'm using more use of 3D verbs and stuff to keep the character. But I still think the spatiality is, I think it really helps it. So it makes it. I hate to use the phrase again, it makes it not so flat and more 3DS because I can create the room around it. That's great. And then I see Brian Montgomery with a question. Hi, Brian. I think George could answer this because he, he kind of works this way or used to. How are you determining when to use the beds and when to use the objects? Are we concerned that the size of the data within the Atmos ADM media container can incredibly be bloated and large when exclusively using many objects and many be subject and many of them to be subject to excessive data compression for the end user playback. Would using mostly beds be a more efficient and lead to a higher quality delivery? Go ahead, George. Well, let's start here. Uh, when you're streaming Atmos, there are a limited number of objects that can be represented. And Michael, we, we, we said 24 last week, but it may be as little as 16. I, yeah, I think it, it's, uh, it, it depends, but yes, uh, it, it's, it goes hand in hand with level, almost level three. There's, so there's similarities between the two, between Sony and Dolby with the number of objects. But I, I'd have to say, I'm not so worried about the size of those files. Uh, in terms of delivery, they're, you know, they're deliverable. And in terms of re-rendering, they're re-renderable. Uh, what makes my choice between objects and beds is different sure, than Eric's, it's different than Jeff Balding's, right. but we use both. You have to use You both. use both, George. That's why I thought this question right. uh, would be good for you, because I know yeah. that you that's how you mix. And right now, as I said, Eric and I are talking about maybe touching on delivering separate object groups to Michael, 
so that he can better deliver between formats and choose. Right. But by the way, that means that we have to sort out dynamics, multi-channel dynamics, and we're not going to tell you what we're going right. to do. Right, and we have to still sort the time alignment issues. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Delay compensation and time alignment is a huge continuing issue. Yeah. Yes. Hey, uh, and linking of channels and, and all, all sorts and of- And linking things. channels to control side chains. Exactly. Yeah. Not fucking with the image. Sorry, can I say that? Not messing with the image and things, you know, shifting all over the place. <laughs> yeah. I love it that you were the first one to drop an F bomb, Michael. <laughs> I've been so I, I would have thought it would have been you, George. Yes. <laughs> but um, I just real quick, answer. can I can I answer something? I see Jeff's follow up here. I just wanted to yes. say something else that I would love to see if there is a way because he he touched on something that I actually asked about. Um, with uh with uh, Dolby some time ago but I actually hadn't followed through with Anne with Sony Sony on this is you know it it would be it seems to me that adding the stereo mix the left right to the last two objects of any format makes sense that you're automatically carrying the stereo with you period exactly. and it, there is no way to screw that up what because it's embedded idea. in there yeah, I think it, that's a path cool. forward to look at this for all of these companies is keep the yeah. stereo engaged. It never gets lost. It, you never have a problem. You never know where it is. You know, yes. Anyway. And and it should be a way that it defaults to stereo when people don't have, right? Right. Birdie. Your, yeah. your, your in-ears or a sound bar or. Absolutely. Birdie. Um, somebody asked, what's the difference between binaural and stereo? Right. So I thought that was a good question, Michael. That's a great question. Yeah. yeah. Um, George, you want to? No, let, let's let Michael do it. Oh, I, I just thought if you want. Well, okay. Well, well, we have binaural. Uh, well, stereo is two channel. In fact, uh, my understanding, original stereo is three channels. Uh, channel uh, that stereo is is dialogue in the center for film and left and right. Uh, was was the original version of that was why there were three channel heads and three on tape machines and three channel consoles and that th th that was original anyway as we look at it we're looking at left and right in the stereo world binaural is an encoding either through ambisonics or some other format to try to include localization in a 3d field within a two channel playback and the way that started was with or one of the starting points was with the neumann head mm -hmm. with the fake head and listening to two microphones in right. the ear physiology uh, in that structure to let that create the localization that you would get through earphones. Yeah. And it I, and was I, interesting. Well, and a this functional difference between the two is that one is the represent is actually the left and right of the speakers that are output that are, if you're coming into your headphones or listening to stereo like that. The, the, the binaural is, is the, uh, uh, um, is is not looking at left and right, but it's looking at that sense of space using the head, like you said with Neumann, how we perceive is time, subtle timing and tonal differences using our two ears and our head as a meat baffle, you know, I in just between. saw a, a Zeccarelli <laughs> holophonic. So there's that. Look at this. Look at this, oh, Mike. Fritz, By the way, he right. stole a mic pre from me. Um, and yeah, I haven't Fritz. heard from him for 30 years. <laughs> that, that was a very good thought. I'm sorry to interrupt, but there are any number uh, of re-vectorization uh, yeah. uh, algorithms and things happening in the ambisonic space. And there's more ambisonics coming, yeah. more than level yeah. three. And as far as capture and record, I think this is a good segue. Roe Shamir has a question and, you know, are there, you know, George, we talk about this, how are we capturing? So he has a question as far as capture and record, any experience you could share with natural Atmos, as I call a dedicated mic per intended number of channels, it's different than Ambio miking options. It's big different. question. Big question. Assigning the other, other part of that, yeah. the other part of that question is, yeah. is we have these rendered formats. We have codecs now. What are we putting on the shelf for the future? Right. Are we right. putting on the shelf for the future something that can be re-rendered in 20 years to whatever the new format is where we're not limited by these codecs we're not limited by the either the dolby codec or or any right. form of the codecs we have very possibly an original 714 uh physical format that we could print right now and put that on the shelf 
I'd love to see that we get to a spot where we are. I mean, the MP, the, what people are listening to is essentially the MP3s of the stereo files. And we've been working in high res audio for a long time in the stereo world. I would love to see the consumers hear what we're hearing resolution wise in the speakers. I would love that the, if you could, if we, if some, uh, you know, company came out, ambitious company and sold ADM files, you know, or sold the Sony files or something that people put on their, put on their servers at home or wherever they are, their files to listen to and hear the full resolution, full resolution. So as, as we're, as codecs are developing, you know, speakers are still the standard in a tune room, the gold right. standard for playback as codecs are developing for people listening in different decoding methods, speakers, headphones, and all of that. Um, you know, I would love to see that we get where you also talk about resolution and number of objects and and trying to get it back, get get people into experiences, experiencing it as we do all do on a daily basis, how powerful and moving and emotional it can be, especially like this question about miking and certain things like uh, I, I figured, George, I thought you would jump straight to Morton Lindbergh about his miking techniques right. for what he right. does. And, you know, as far well, as a, not an ambio well, mic, but that. yeah, let's, let's, let's talk about that for just a second. Yeah, just, please because I think that's entirely relevant, yeah. is one of our very, very favorite recording engineer producers is Morten Lindbergh of Oslo, Norway. And he has set, he has a workflow, a beautiful workflow set up where he is basically one mic per track. And he spends untold numbers of hours, days, and weeks setting up rooms and players and that one microphone and working on the score, working on performances. And he captures this pretty much one mic per speaker. He does some mixing, he does some, some post work, but basically it's one mic per speaker and his recording and reproduction is existence defining in terms of immersivity, immersion. Yeah. Um, right. And so that's a good place to start is what's the best example. And that's one, but boy, he has trouble with Dolby Atmos, not sounding I, very I good. I added nice. another point of view, George, which is, um, let's say we're recording a piano and let's say we want to get the feeling of the piano inside the room depending on how the songs are arranged yes i would advocate more microphones to to really sp speak to the room and i'm going to go to a broadcast thing for example in the grammys for about three or four years we haven't used yet we hang we hang hype mics way uh, up in the hall and that's for the time when we can do a real immersive broadcast couple of year, years, years ago, me and the guy who coordinates the sound department went up to the ranch and mixed it in Atmos, and those hype mics were amazing. So I, I think when were. you're miking, you want to think about how are you going to play that sound source back in, in, in the space? So yes, I think you should be thinking about that. And is there, I know Leslie Ann Jones had mentioned this at one point, what companies are coming out with multi-channel mics? Well, Sennheiser has their mic, right, George? Yeah, uh, the new. There are several new um, eigen mics, uh, mics with twenty-four outputs called eigen vectors mm -hmm. that can be put anywhere. You can take an eigen vector and say, "Well, I want that a little louder. I want that softer. Let's move that." And it's not exactly hi-fi technology, so to speak, but it's promising. And there's, there are a couple, the Sennheiser's one, and there are a couple of other Ambio mics coming out. Well, well there's all, I mean, beyond the, beyond the, um, oh shit, what's the Ambisonics mic The oh, no, I can't even, I can picture it, but I can't what even. Shit? What's the shit? Yeah, yeah, what's that shit? What, sorry, you said it, I didn't say it. Okay, so, <laughs> but there's also, there are companies have, like, like we have one. And, Chefs and DPA and a handful of other companies build, you know, like the bicycle seat or have different versions of arrays that are pre-configured. Yeah. Right. I, that's my next thing, honestly, when Alicia gets on piano and vocal is how can I capture it? I'm going to start experimenting with a lot of these mics and she's an artist that will love, loves to experiment. She loves the technology. So I'm excited. I'm excited to record even if she does three or four songs in a row from her catalog and we do an experimental session and then I'm going to send it to George and record all the mics at once and, and see four, four mics what we start with them. four mics in the air see, yep. see how that works out the problem with commercial production as as we all well know is how do you fix a vocal without repeating that circumstance okay 
Alicia, just sit there at the piano and let's do all the vocals with you there at the piano so we could capture not only the space, but also the cross of the leakage into the piano mics. All of these things that add to, add to the size of a mix. Uh, but that's very hard to do. Boy, is that hard to do. I remember that, Roey. Yes, West Side Story with the four mics. That's, that's, really, that's a really good starting point. And I'm going to really, like, now I have the time. We just finished a gang of, you know, but I'm working on a Christmas album right now. So I'm going to try to implement a couple of these things, George, and we'll be beta testers as we always are. Let's figure it out. Figure it out. Yes. Well, you know, I, I was thinking like what uh, Chuck Ainley did, uh, just list the the Lie I Love It record. I got a chance to work on that with him. And when he was thinking about my, even miking the drums, he didn't use stereo overheads. He used a quad overhead he for did. the drums. Yeah. And it comes out supernatural. And yep. he had room mics on the on the horn section, you know, mm -hmm. and it, it's pretty amazing. I would love to remix that record. Hey, and there's a question here. Somebody's asking about um, custom um, a -A -A HRTFs. Which I think we should speak to before, you know. Go ahead, Eric. I don't see that one, no, but uh, well, it's at the very bottom. It says, "Are there custom HRTFs?" And I know for us, we we can get them made for Sony. And I think I've heard that there are consumer apps that will take a shot of your ear and look at the yes, yeah, the shape yeah. of your ear and geometry. They, 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 I'm going to be the naysayer. They don't work very well. Uh, the, the Yamaha started okay. this 15 years ago, and oh, okay. it, it takes a picture of your and then tries to find a match with an existing yeah. HRTF data set with yeah. the same look. I mean, it's kind of an AI approach, but it doesn't really work well. What does work well is individual HRTFs at different source locales and build an HRTF set, and that's where Sony and I think Dolby to some extent are moving ahead is those that idea of custom answers yes because that's the best if we could get that man we'd have it made but it's very expensive and it's limited and i like to say we got to do this panel a year from now and see oh it's how the technology point. developed right like we that's need a to great keep, point we need to keep doing these to make sure the technology is developing not just allowing these companies to market something that they're not developing and evolving it's the people in the field like us every day, the people in the field that are in this chat that are trying to, you know, find solutions, that are trying to find problems, you know, solve problems. And I think it's really important that all of us collectively as a whole just keep, you know, trying to evolve the technology. And as I call us, we're beta testers in all this. It's like the wild, wild west. And I think we need to keep holding the record labels responsible, get the artists more involved in you know, the immersive mixing and treat the budgets and the protocols like you treat all the other deliverables, you know, and, and I think it came a long way, but go ahead, and we're not going to hit a home run every time. Correct. We're not going to get it perfectly right every time. We're, we're going to have to do a lot of experiment, a lot of, of, of being honest. If something doesn't sound good, let's dig into it and fix it. Yeah. Record companies don't experiment anymore. I don't know whether you've noticed, but they, they're not much for experimenting. You used to be pushing innovation. Now, I, I hate to say sort of the stewards of back catalog, but it's, you know, it's a, you know, the, um, uh, the, the business model has changed for a lot of people, not everybody, but a lot of folks just turn in their record to the label rather than go through the artist development point of it. I'd, I, you know, just, just see, Hey, you know, what, I mean, this is so philosophically left field. If we got into, you know, would Springsteen have, if, if he had tried to come out today or Dylan or something, would they have had the chance without the label and somebody that believed them behind them, you know, to be able to push it and to allow them to develop in a way we're sort of in the immersive world is we need to allow it to develop, but we also need to push it to be able to create the best use of it, not a functional use of it. We don't want to turn around and have this to be the, you know, 3D television of the audio world. We want right. to be able to say, this is where we're moving <laughs> forward. We Good experience wor the world in a three-dimensional, let's experience our art in the same way. 
but it takes exactly. attention to detail. It takes a commitment. It takes, uh, you know, respect for the format and it, and it, and it takes, you know, pushing the boundaries to find a way to make sure that people hear it the way it's supposed to be done with best practices, not just let's take the stems from the stereo and let's, let's take all the super compressed buses and then we'll just deliver those to the labels. Then the labels say, Hey, we're going to take this and make it immersive. You've already, you know, committed so much at that point. I think that was one of the amazing things about this project, Anne, is that you envision like, let's go back to the source. And I think we, you know, I, I think that we really found that through all the work and experimentation and stuff that that is the best practice. And I wish, yeah. I, I hope yeah. going I think, forward, labels and artists do that as well. Go back and say, wait a minute. Correct. And look, we, our first album we delivered, right, was on tape. I had to go back and listen to those stereo mixes and recreate edits that was done on an SSL <laughs> with automation. I had to go and mute the files, you know, we had to recreate the arrangements. And I think it's important. I think it's important, Michael, to deliver to the mixer, your raw files, your stems and your mastered mixes. And we got in a groove, render your plugins. Me and George learned that from the first song I gave George, I left auto tune on, like Brenda, like, or, or Melodyne or something like render. Cause there's different versions of plugins when you open old sessions and yep. render your files. Like, you know, and we, I would love to do another class somewhere on how to build an immersive template because once we found our template, it was like, it was, we had such a, it was sweet. Workflow. And yes. We had to learn to avoid the plugin swamp. The plugin swamp is a dangerous place to go. <laughs> exactly. So look, um, I want to, you know, we're over time. Um, I want to give a huge shout out to the mayor's office and everyone involved in putting this together, the producers and engineers wing, Maureen Droney. Yeah, Maureen. You know, we're, all, yeah, Maureen. we're all coming from you from all parts of the world. I'm in Milan, Italy. George is in Montreal. Eric is in California and Michael is in uh, San Northern Fran California. I'm in Berkeley, yeah, Northern, Northern, California. Northern California. And I just want to say thank you everyone for the effort you made in joining this panel. Let's do this again. Great. Let's keep evolving the technology and uh, thank you all. We'll see you next time, right? Yeah. Everybody. Thanks, Anne. Really appreciate it. All see right, everybody. Cheers. Bye, everybody. Well done.